I'd like to begin this Monday Thursday message with a verse from Psalm 41. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. Have you ever had someone betray you? Someone who turned against you? You know, it's interesting, while we have all of this extra time at home and we're trying to, to shelter in place, stay home, work safe, our dog Shadow has been the beneficiary. Shadow loves having his people home. And we've been going on these walks. In fact, we've taken him in the car on some rides. He is absolutely thriving in the midst of this exile period. So much so that the other night when we were getting ready to leave, Shadow rushed to the door. And he was trying to nose his way out. We told him, no, you're not going with us. And when we closed the door, Shadow began to howl. Not the usual barking that he does. He began to howl this mournful sound. And I could tell that he's saying to the whole world, these people are betraying me. There's something about betrayal that hurts deeply. Now, that's a silly example. But there are other examples that, that are a lot more painful and a lot more real. So, for example... Have you ever been betrayed at work? Someone you thought was on your team, somebody you thought was part of, of the, the goal and, and the thing that you were moving toward, and they turn, they turn on you? Or maybe you've been betrayed in a relationship. Someone that you've loved and cared about has stabbed you in the back. Maybe you've been betrayed by your own body. You know, I think of a dear friend of mine, Pastor Eric Tricky. Uh, in Decatur, Illinois. Eric has been battling cancer for years where his body is fighting against him. And he's at the point of losing that battle. In fact, in the e-newsletter that I sent out, and maybe you've seen on Facebook, we're asking anybody and everybody who's willing to send a note of encouragement to Eric and to his family because Eric has just a short time left to live. When our body betrays us, it causes pain, not just physical pain, it causes emotional pain. Psalm 41, the psalmist is speaking about this betrayal. And to really understand it, you need to recognize that when it talks about someone who has shared a meal with him, he's talking about a close friend, a, a, a close relationship. Somebody who's not just an acquaintance. You see, eating together in, in biblical times wasn't a social activity. It was an expression of deep and close friendship. And when that friendship is betrayed, it causes deep emotional pain. So in the, the Jesus' time, the Pharisees had 341 different uh, rules regarding theological issues. Do you realize that of those 341 rules, 229, so over 60%, had to do with whom you could and could not eat? Eating wasn't just a social thing. It was a big deal, and it indicated intimacy and closeness and friendship. And so for that to be broken, it was huge. That's what the psalmist is talking about. That terrible pain that comes on a deep emotional level when a relationship is betrayed. That brings us to our text for today, and it's the setting for Monday Thursday. In Luke chapter 22... When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So Jesus sits down with his disciples for a meal, but it's not just any meal. It is a very special meal. It's the Passover meal. And if you remember, the whole idea of Passover goes all the way back to the Israelites in Egypt. The Israelites were there and they were under terrible duress. They were suffering profoundly under the slavery of Pharaoh. And God sent Moses to have his people freed from that slavery. Well, in the process, God is delivering these, these plagues on Egypt, trying to bring Pharaoh to an understanding. He cannot win this battle. He must let God's people go. And over and over again, Pharaoh is absolutely stalwart. His heart is hardened, and he will not heed. Finally, God is preparing to send the last plague, and this is a terrible plague. It's a plague where the firstborn of everything and everyone is going to die. 
But God wants to make sure that his people, the people of Israel, don't suffer under the same plague that is going to inflict the Egyptians. And so God gives these instructions to Moses for the sake of his people. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Take care of them until the fourteenth day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. In this Passover, God is delivering his people, saving them from the wickedness of Egypt, and he's saving them from his judgment on their sin. Now fast forward from the Passover meal to this Monday, Thursday, the very first one, where Jesus is there with his disciples, and they're preparing for the same Passover meal. But even as Jesus is where, there with them, remember, his name means the Lord saves. And he is about to give to them, deliver to them, the ultimate salvation. What Jesus does with this meal is incredible. In verse 19, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Jesus takes the bread of the Passover and he, he takes that bread, that unleavened bread from Exodus chapter 12. And now if we fast forward to Deuteronomy, we see that he's going to give us a more specific name. We're going to understand this bread in a whole different way because Deuteronomy says the bread of affliction. That in Egypt, the Israelites were experiencing all kinds of affliction, pain, and suffering. And Jesus now tells us that this bread is going to be connected to his suffering. He says in Luke chapter 22, verse 15, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. What was once connected to Israel's suffering, Jesus now connects to his suffering to his pain and agony. But he's not finished. Because it goes on in Luke chapter 22, verse 20. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So Jesus is saying to his disciples, just in case you missed what I was saying about the affliction and the suffering that's connected with the bread, I want you to understand, my blood is going to be poured out. Now let's just pause for a minute. When we're talking about someone having their blood drawn, we're talking about something that's controlled and it's intentional and it can even be productive if they're testing or trying to understand something about that person's body. When we talk about someone's blood being poured out, that's always bad. And so Jesus is helping us understand that the affliction in the bread and the pouring out of his blood is all about his suffering for us. But he's still not finished. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. Well, that brings us all the way back to Psalm 41. Do you remember that verse? Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. What Jesus is saying here is that that's what's happening to me. One of you will betray me. I'm going to suffer physically on a cross. I'm also going to suffer emotionally because of you, because of this betrayal. You know, it might sound like Jesus is making a complaint here, but I want to be crystal clear. Jesus is not complaining. He's taking the time to show his disciples and, and through them to show us what salvation really is looks like. That's what this meal is all about. It's Jesus suffering profoundly on our behalf. And so what I want to do in the last portion of this message, I want to share with you three points. I know that's a big surprise, but I want to share three points and talk about what salvation really is. Ready? Point number one, salvation is physical. 
That's one of the ways that Christianity is so different from so many other religions. We don't just have a God who is out there and not necessarily connected to us. We have a God who literally came to us physically. He took on human flesh to win salvation for us. Think about what Jesus did. He died physically. He rose bodily. Jesus takes physical elements of bread and wine and he uses those to say to us, I am with you physically. I am saving you physically. By the way, that's what we call the real presence. It's a doctrine uh, and it's the heart and center of what we believe about the Lord's Supper. That when we take the Lord's Supper, the body and blood of Jesus is truly there. It's really present in, with, and under the bread and wine. In fact, Luther puts it this way. The Lord's Supper is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine for us Christians to eat and drink. Jesus is really there with us every time we take communion. You know, that's comforting in a crazy time like this, don't you think? Comforting when you and I are literally in a physical battle against a deadly disease. And it reminds us that that we have a God who offers to us salvation, not just in a spiritual sense, but in a real, literal, physical sense. You know, that reminds me. I want to take a moment in the midst of this to say thank you. There are some wonderful people among us, and I think much like we gained an appreciation for first responders at 9-11, we're gaining a very special appreciation for those who are working as medical professionals, for first responders certainly again, for those who are, who are serving as grocery checkers, for those who are working in child care centers, for people who are supporting essential workers of every sort. I want to say thank you. Because you are, you are in a difficult spot, and there's no doubt you have to be concerned for your own well-being, and yet you're rising above that concern to serve all of us, to make our lives better, and in real ways to save lives. And so to all of you, to all of you who are in harm's way on behalf of the rest of us, thank you. We are grateful to you and grateful for you. You know, when you're helping us in our physical needs, you really are the hands and feet of Jesus. And so, please, know that our gratitude is with you all throughout this crisis. Jesus understands the struggles that come along with our physical bodies. In fact, I love this amazing promise in Psalm 34. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Our God sends His physical Son to be with us in our physical lives. And we can now literally taste and see His love for us in this physical meal. It's an amazing promise and an amazing truth. So, first of all, point number one, salvation is physical. Point number two, salvation is relational. You know, when Jesus says that his disciples are going to betray him because it's not just one. One is going to betray him in a profound way, but the others are going to abandon him. But when Jesus says that, it breaks my heart. Breaks my heart to think that Jesus is about to carry the most difficult, the heaviest burden ever. He's going to carry the sin of the whole world to the cross to win salvation for us. It's the time when he needs his friends and he needs their support the most. And instead, he's dealing with the brutal pain of betrayal. But you know, it also breaks my heart to think about Judas. Judas has no idea what he's doing, has no understanding of what's about to happen because he's he's giving in to his own best idea. He thinks he understands and he has no clue. And the heartbreak and devastation to Judas is devastating. But you know, it also breaks my heart when I think about the fact you and I fall into that same pattern. How often do we decide we're going to do it our own way? We're going to do the thing that makes sense to us. We're going to simply make our choices and then justify them. And the fact of the matter is, that's not God's way. God invites us to walk with him. And instead of betraying him and choosing our own path and making ourselves gods of our own little universe, he invites us to be obedient. And yet all too often, We turn away. You know, the Bible is clear that by our own nature, we are enemies of God. 
We have broken away from God. We have followed our own, our own ideas and our relationship is shattered. And yet, God invites us to this meal of intimate fellowship. Why? Because God wants to restore our broken relationship with him. Paul says it beautifully in Romans chapter 5. While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. And I don't know if you've ever experienced the, the pain of a child in rebellion, a child that, that breaks with his family, a child that, that follows their own path. And, and no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you do, no matter what you do in terms of intervention, they continue to follow their own path. And the relationship with the family is shattered. And yet speaking as someone with experience, I want you to understand that the heart and mind of a father and mother, even though they may have to set boundaries and they may have to allow that child in rebellion to, to go away, the desire is always to be reunited. It's always for that broken relationship to be mended. Brothers and sisters, that's how God feels about us. He longs for us. He wants us back so badly he was willing to allow his son to endure this profound affliction and this terrible emotional pain just to restore that relationship with him. Salvation is physical. Salvation is deeply emotional. Point number three, salvation is eternal. You know, we all know that when we eat or drink, we get hungry and thirsty again, right? But this meal is different. In fact, I, I love what Jesus says in Luke 22, verse 16. I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Now, what I don't like is this is Jesus' last meal. He doesn't eat again. In fact, the only thing he's offered between now and his death is a little bit of wine vinegar. This is literally the last of his meal. But I love what he says. It's his last meal until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is looking past the meal. He's looking past the betrayal. He's looking past the suffering. He's looking past his dying. He's looking into eternity. In fact, the apostle John gets a little glimpse of that eternity. Years later, when John is an old man, he has a, a vision of heaven. And listen to these words. Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. There is an eternal feast that's coming. There is a, a feast, a banquet for all of God's people that's coming on the horizon. Jesus saw it and he knew it was out there. John saw it and he knew it was out there. And you and I, through God's word, know that eternal feast is out there waiting for us. You know, I love, I love the old liturgical view of this. And one particular line says, grace our table with your presence. So we're talking to God. Grace our table with your presence and give us a foretaste of the feast to come. You know, whenever I celebrate communion, I love to think about the fact that, that when we come together in communion, it's not just those of us who are gathered in a room. It's, it's all of God's church. It is the Christian church all around the world who is united in celebration of our salvation through this holy meal. But it's more than that. We also know that it's all of our loved ones who've gone before who trust in Jesus. It's the church triumphant. Literally what that means is it's every Christian person who is no longer struggling along in this life. They've been delivered from death to life eternal. They are triumphant in their faith. And we know that that, that whole body of people. So I remind people after the loved ones die, they're celebrating communion. And when they come together for that meal, their loved ones are there. My dad, my son, my granddad, dear friends, loved ones all around. They're there with us, and it's not just them. It's the angels and the archangels and the entire company of heaven gathered together in holy communion. While we are separated in all kinds of different ways by distance and by death and by the plane of reality even, we are separated but together. You know, dear friends, that has special meaning for me in this time. 
because we are separated from one another. We're separated because of a pestilence that, that's causing all kinds of fear and bringing death and worry to so many lives. And so we are separated. But what an amazing thing. That same Holy Spirit that joins us with the church around the world and the church triumphant and the whole host of heaven, that same Holy Spirit unites us so that while we are separated, we are together together. 